as we come to this evening of Ash Wednesday, I need to say that um, Washington Glad must be smiling because his pulpit has been used twice in February. Uh, it's not usually used more than once a year, so on Ash Wednesday we do bring it into the sanctuary, but we had it here for our friend Dr. Moxley a few weeks ago. Beginning today and continuing through Easter Sunday, April 9th, our theme for this season is forgiveness. We will experience this in worship on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. and in small groups that will be held in homes and here at the church throughout the month of March. So I encourage you, of course, to join with us in worship and in the small groups, but I would like for you to take it a step further this season and engage forgiveness in your daily discipline of prayer and your reflection during these 40 days of Lent. For example, is there a place in your life or a person in your life that you need to forgive? And who do you need to ask forgiveness from for the ways that you have thought or spoken of them and maybe acted toward them in ways that have harmed them their families or the community. Or in a larger scale, perhaps we would look at debt, debt and the actions in our lives and in our communities, our nation and our world, where debt needs to be forgiven. And how can we set things right in relation to those in the human family and the earth that need to be cared for? So this season, we will be blessed by preaching from Reverend Amanda Connolly, Reverend John Ashbery, Reverend Sarah Reed, Reverend Larry Miller, and Reverend Joanna Samuelson. Each of them members of our community and each has served in congregational settings or in settings of chaplaincy and social justice witness, caring for thousands of people across the years. So we're grateful for what is about to unfold in worship for their presence in our congregation and in the pulpit of First Church. Would you join me in prayer as we step into our series on forgiveness? Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Forgiveness is not too hard to understand but it is surprisingly easy to misunderstand. Forgiveness is not something that you have to accomplish. It's not something you deserve. Forgiveness is always present, although we don't always recognize it or accept it. Forgiveness is part of the present moment, every moment of every day. It is the divine face of God, which is our divine love that offers to each of us hope. Forgiveness is a fresh start. It's a new beginning. This is always true no matter what has happened, is happening, or even what might happen. Through forgiveness, an option for fresh start and new beginning is offered to you and me and everyone in every moment. Forgiveness takes from the, present, from the past moment and offers present hope for change. Forgiveness looks at the past because the past is real, but it cannot be changed. The past cannot be changed, but our relationship to the past can be changed. The first change we may need to consider is our memory of the past. We have forgotten the real past. What memory we do have of the past is a memory of what we thought was the real past at the time, but our thinking was always limited. It was always a mix of somewhat true and somewhat flawed. However flawed our memory, and this Ash Wednesday, it's a good time to confess and acknowledge wherever the flaws in our memory are, the real past is completely gone, and the real past is already forgiven. A fresh start is at hand. Perhaps that fresh start will include remembering more of the real past. And when 
we remember the real past, perhaps we will laugh, perhaps we will cry, or how we will come to understand by looking at it the mistaken views that we've had of the past. Cleaning up such memories may improve our lives, but not the consequence of what our lives have done. These consequences live on as a part of our capacity as human beings to alter the course of history. We altered history in every moment of our past living, just as we will alter the course of history in our next action and even in our next thinking about our next action. You see, every motion, everything in our brain, of our, in our body, alters the course of history in our lives and in the lives of all we touch and those that touch others because of that. Such truth can be healing, but such truth can also be tragic. Yet there's this wondrous karma of what is real. Nevertheless, and remember, God is always in the nevertheless. A fresh start is always open before us now. No admission fee is required. No begging is necessary. There is no price to pay for this fresh start except the consequences of taking on this humbling new start in our lives. Our understanding of this forgiveness for a fresh start makes us bolder in our freedom to take on the consequences. And we can make this unprecedented leap into the future because we know, however this works out, we will be forgiven for the fresh start once again. Forgiven does not mean that we have an excuse or a permission to flee from real life or to indulge in our worst impulses and potential meanness. We will pay the consequences of whatever actions we do. We will remain in need of forgiveness for whatever we do. Believing in forgiveness means believing that there is a fresh start in the realism that is before us, right now and always. Let, alone, let us also be warned that our choices can become stuck ways of life for our personal being, ways to which we cling, we defend, and we never own up or accept the needed forgiveness. Being stuck in unrealism is like an internal bondage or slavery in which we may have become powerless to change. We cannot presume that when we have lost touch with reality, that reality will find us again ever, at least not right away. We can drift down the corridor of time for quite a while before the judgment of our unrealism comes up against the review of our lives. We need to take care to not mess with reality or thumb our nose at reality or think that we can get away with creating our own reality. Consider how long the racist patterns of the U.S. Confederacy have lived on in the lives of both whites and blacks and all in between. We are all forgiven for what happened for a fresh start in a new world order in which black and white have no more horrific implications being engaged with one another, no more than the weather of the day. Nevertheless, we cling to familiar patterns of status and privilege, of mindsets and rages, rather than be forgiven for that fresh start that fights like this cast and this tragic energy in the ongoing culture. To overcome the unforgiveness of such a culture, we have to step into and own the perverse reality and sickness which it has unleashed. Martin Luther King Jr. and other key leaders in the civil rights movement helped us find a fresh start on this unrealism. But we return to it and we cling to it and we slip back into old, familiar, untenable patterns of delusion and racism. Many U.S. citizens persist in fanning and fostering our racial delusions for the sake of some other delusion than reality that hasn't vanished from our land. So, when and if reality has found us again, we need to grab hold of reality with all of its forgiveness and fresh starts before we lose our way again. The payout 
of unrealism and unforgiveness is despair in the end, for reality overcomes despair. And the payout for reality, however costly in some ways it may be, is always to be on the right side of things. It is always for healing and always for hope because reality wins in the end. Let me say it again. Forgiveness is not too hard to understand, but it is surprisingly easy to misunderstand. Forgiveness is huge. It might be the greatest work any one of us will ever do in our lifetime. The heart of our Christian faith is forgiveness. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it best, Christianity is forgiveness, nothing more and nothing less. Bonhoeffer was not one to waste words. This sentence is typical. Every phrase carries deep meaning. Nothing more, if you call yourself a Christian, you better be ready to back it up. I don't say this to scare anyone away from calling themselves a Christian. I'm just saying it to encourage you to live into the forgiveness that we're called to live into as Christians. Nobody walked the walk of faith and forgiveness better than Bonhoeffer. You remember his last act before he was assassinated by the Nazi firing squad was to have communion with the men who shot him dead. That's the kind of person we're talking about. Perhaps Bonhoeffer had in mind the words of Jesus as he was dying on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. All the theological interpretation that has gone into this sentence put aside, the plain and simple idea is to forgive others under whatever circumstances we face and they face. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Another phrase that we say all the time and we'll say again tonight. All of us have heard these words, have spoken these words a thousand times in the Lord's Prayer. Perhaps some of you were saying trespasses for hundreds of years before you got here, but we say debts. Nothing more can be asked of us than for us to step back and realize that we have offend, been offended by another and then to let it go. That's what forgiveness is. It's a letting go of the past grievance and pain and hurt that we're carrying. That does not mean that we forget. For many of us, we're afraid that forgiving means that we'll be forced to forget. That's not the case. Forgiving is not the same as forgetting. We all get hung up on that worry about forgiving and forgetting. Let's not get our worries to drive us backwards. Forgiving is not the same as forgetting. Your memory of the past will not disappear when you forgive, but your memory will heal when you forgive. Bonhoeffer meant that, by forgive, that forgiveness is central, and it is the most that we can do, the most that can be asked of us, but it is asked of us in every single situation. Forgiveness is not a sometimes or a somewhere proposition. It is not a once and done posture. Forgiveness lasts for life. We are asked for nothing more than this. We are asked to seek, not to seek vengeance anymore, not to dissolve into endless anger, and surely not to rage. We are meant to forgive. Nothing less, he says. What would be less than forgiveness? Many things, beginning with holding grudges. We hold grudges when we think that we are superior to those who have offended us. We have fallen into the trap. We hold the incident over their heads as if it were never to release them from the, what we know or believe we know and never to relent on the pressure available in a moment of confrontation. This way we never have to deal with forgiveness because we hold ourselves to be permanently in the right. Less than forgiveness may mean ignoring others who have offended you as well. Rather than forgive, it is easier to simply bypass the whole process and act as if nothing ever happened. This is retreat from responsibility to oneself. You owe it to yourself to confront those who have wronged you in a clear and matter, and, and when it's happened, you need to take that to them. 
How have they wronged you? Is it that the exact place and the way of forgiveness must take the place of judgment? Yes, not by accusing and judging, but rather by expressing how an action made you feel. You can enter a renewed relationship with another. Then once reconciled, let it go. Less than forgiveness may mean ignoring the truth that you have been hurt or offended. This never works. You can bury pain under a blanket of platitudes, but the truth remains that you have been diminished, and it is better to come clean about that. So Bonhoeffer gives us a gift tonight. I ask you, as you take away these two things from this Ash Wednesday reflection, remember, forgiveness is not too hard to understand, but it is surprisingly easy to misunderstand. So let's not misunderstand forgiveness, rather, Let's step into the fresh start of understanding forgiveness and then practice it. And second, Christianity is forgiveness. Nothing more, nothing less. To not forgive is not Christian. To fail to forgive, you fail to be the Christian you were baptized to be. To be unforgiving is to not follow Jesus. It's that simple. As we step into 40 days of Lent, we have a season of forgiveness to embrace, us and for us to embrace. So let's start. Let's start now, let's start tonight. With the cross of Christ calling us to be truly who we are meant to be, may each one of us be forgiven and forgiving. Amen. <laughs>